Very good. Welcome, everyone. We're here today to talk about a topic called How Women Rise. And today is Diversity and Inclusion Day, I think, in India. So here's what we're going to do. First thing, men move that way. All these seats in the front and all these things, only for the women, including the students in the back. Women in the front, please. Women in the front. <laughs> women in the front. Let's go. Women in the front. Come on. In the front. Women. Women. All women in the front. You too. Up here. <laughs> women in front. Yeah, let's go. We've got all these couches here. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I've met about half of you, and half of you I haven't met, so I will introduce myself to the ones I haven't met. My name is Marshall. I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. Went to school in Indiana. I got a PhD at UCLA. So I travel around the world giving talks and teaching classes. I coach executives. I uh, write books and articles. So I've done 41 books. And today we're going to be talking about one of my newer books. is called How Women Rise, Breaking the 12 Habits That Can Hold Women Back. And uh, I love getting emails. Send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. And there's my website, www.marshallgoldsmith.com. Now, what are we going to do today? I want to talk a little bit about the background of our book, where this book came from, How Women Rise, why it's important, and how I co-author Sally Helgeson and I did this together. Okay? Then I'm going to discuss concepts from our book that relate to coaching, career development. I'm going to talk about helping women that want to get ahead and the leaders who want to get there. So for the men in the back, you can pay attention as well, too, because this is for the men. Good for you to talk about how to help women who might want to become leaders do a good job of being a mentor, a coach, or helping other women, and some of the unique issues women have. And what is this guy? Wait a minute. Ah, ah, out, out. The front is only for women. Look around. Get down. <laughs> That's the way these men are. You notice that? Yeah, I move into the front all the time, right? And then I'm going to talk about a key learnings from Peter Drucker, and I'm going to share. I, I've taught many classes for women in leadership. I'm going to share the most popular 10 minutes I do in my women's program. Uh, and the goal, final goal is going to be be happier and have less guilt. Now, if any of you women would like to be more miserable and have more guilt, you should not attend the program. <laughs> this is only for ones that would like to be happier and have a little less guilt. And men in the back, if you don't mind, I'm going to address my comments to women because this is for women. Men can get the point about how it relates to them, but rather than having to translate back and forth as I talk, I'm just going to be speaking largely to the women in the room. Now, let us begin. One thing I'm really happy with in our book is we've received no negative political feedback. Now, in America, to write a book for women and get no negative political feedback from the left or the right is almost impossible. So I'm very happy with the fact that we've received literally no negative political feedback. And one of the reasons is our book doesn't make a value judgment. Our book doesn't say women should try to have more levels of status or power. What it says is, if you want to, this book is designed to help you get there. It doesn't say you should. Our intention is not to tell other people how to live their lives. I'm not in the tell you who you are business. I'm going to help you become who you want to be business. So this book is to help people who would like to do this do a better job of it. Now, how did the book begin? I wrote a very famous book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. A friend of mine named Mike Dulworth and a friend of my friend Sally's sent us an email, and he said, crazy idea, crazy idea. He said, that book is really more about men's issues than women's issues. Well, that's not surprising. About 85% of all the CEOs I coach are men. Not surprising that most of the topics that came out of the book are topics that are related to men. He said, that book is mostly about men's issues, not women's issues. Why don't you write a book like that, only focus much more specifically on issues that women face in their journey to achieve higher levels of influence in life? Well, my friend Sally Helgeson, who's a world's expert on women in leadership, called me up. And Sally said, would you like to do this? I said, look, you write the book. I'll be supportive. We'll do it together. And if it works out, great. So we did it together. The book has been very, very successful, and that's where it came from. A lot of life is just random accident. Now, let us begin. Power can be defined as influence potential. 
if you want to influence people in the world, you're going to need to have power. I'm not saying you should want to influence people. If you do, though, you have to face that reality. The definition of power is our potential to influence. If you have no power, you don't have much potential to influence. Now, and basically our belief is the world would be better off if more women had higher levels of power and authority in life. If you want to have more women leaders, have more women leaders. Companies that have women CEOs don't have a lot of issues with women. Well, we don't have enough women leaders, and one of the best things that can happen for women is help women be more effective. Now, some reflections from great leaders that are women. Overall, women leaders tend to get better 360-degree feedback from their coworkers than men. The average woman gets better 360-degree feedback from their coworkers than the average man. This is not a theory, by the way. It's a fact. A second fact, the average woman is much harder on themselves than the average man. The average woman is more self-critical than the average man. So one coaching I have with women much more than men is this. Please do not be so hard on yourself. Please do not be so hard on yourself. You can't be the perfect wife, mother, daughter, friend, boss, the perfect everything. Don't be too hard on yourself. Now, how many women in the room are from India? Raise your hand. India? Several from India. Yes, India. Women in India, you get bonus guilt. <laughs> bonus guilt for women in India. Not only do you get to be the perfect wife, mother, boss, friend, colleague, you get to be the perfect daughter-in-law. <laughs> and let's tell the truth, women from India. Does she really think you're good enough for her little prince? No. <laughs> no, no, not really good enough for that little prince. Never quite good enough. And how about that food? Oh, very nice. <laughs> so women in India do get a special little treat. Those of you not from India, they even have TV shows about this in India. So this is a very common phenomenon in India. Now, frequent coaching for women, don't be too hard on yourself. Now, everybody needs a partner. You don't have to get up and move around. But you now have 30 seconds. Find one person or two to be your partner. Go, find a partner. Find a partner. Everybody needs a partner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the perfect daughter-in-law very uniquely Indian <laughs> okay everybody gets a partner sit by your good partner now shh, shh, shh. okay sit by your partner we all need a partner now <laughs> In our book, How Women Rise, we talk about 12 classic things that hold women back. I am not have time to cover all 12 in an hour, but we'll cover a couple of the big ones. The first one is positive self-promotion. Women, much more than men, are hesitant to promote themselves. Women are much, much less likely to, to promote themselves, and they tend to equate self-promotion with arrogance or ego or something negative. Even the word ambition, Women have a very different definition of that word ambition than men. With men, it's seen as much more positive. With women, it's seen as somewhat negative, uh, kind of striving too much. Now, one of the great challenges women leaders have much more than men is this. Many women have the following stupid belief. Are we ready? My good work should speak for itself. My good work should speak for itself. How many women in the room have ever had this ridiculous thought before? Look at all these hands. My good work should speak for itself. I'm going to help you. God is not going to fly out of the sky and recognize you for your good work. God has better things to do this week than recognize you for your good work. My good work should speak for itself is a ridiculous idea. If your good work would speak for itself, no company would need a marketing function. Think about that. If your good work would speak for itself, no company would need a marketing function. Why would you need a marketing function? All you have to do is good work, and it will speak for itself. Well, your good work is not going to speak for itself. 
who's in charge of you? You. And you have to say, I've got to be in charge of my own life. I've got to be in charge of my own career. I can't sit around and wait for my good work to speak for itself. Now, by the way, for many of the room, this next part is going to be hard to hear. Some of you may actually think this is too little ego. In another way, it could be too much ego. Let me explain it. Some people think, my work is so good, I shouldn't have to promote myself. I'm above promoting myself. That's okay for those other lesser people who are scrovelling around and trying to get ahead. Not me, of course. I find that beneath me, trying to, to promote myself. I'm kind of better than that. Is that too little ego or too much ego? That's too much ego. Yeah, that's too much ego. You're not that good. I said women tend to be better, not perfect, right? Well, you're not that good. Your good work is not going to speak for itself. And you're in charge of your own marketing function. And if you don't do it, don't expect somebody else to do it for you because they don't care. They don't care. They don't care. And by the way, all the men that say, I'm really going to help women get ahead, uh, except what? How about at the expense of me? No, 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 not that much. I'm happy to help women get ahead, but how about the expense of me? No, 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 no. Ahead of others is okay. That's good. Ahead of those other guys? Fine. Ahead of me? No, 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 no. So don't get overly enamored with if somebody's going to take care of you. The reality is they probably won't. They probably won't. Now, putting your job before your career. This next one I learned from my friend Sally. I love this. It relates to women much more than men. Many women sacrifice their career for their job. I never even heard of this concept before, but it's a brilliant concept. My friend Sally taught it to me. And then when she taught it to me, I realized I've done it in my own life. Many women sacrifice their careers for their jobs. Let me explain what I mean by that. Years ago, I met a great man named Dr. Paul Hersey. Dr. Paul Hersey, one of the highest paid people in the world in my field at the time, I was 28 years old. Uh, he let me follow him around to learn to do what he did. Very kind. I mentioned yesterday I have heroes. He's one of my heroes. <clears throat> anyway, Dr. Hersey called me up one day and he said, you know, Marshall, uh, I'm double booked. Can you do what I do? I said, I don't know. He said, I need it. Can you do what I do? I said, I don't know. He said, I'll pay you $1,000 for one day. That was 42 years ago. I was making $15,000 for one year. I was brought up poor. $1,000 for a day. You know what I said? Sir, yes, sir. I'll try. I did a program for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company in New York. Very, very effective. They loved me, fortunately. They were very angry when I showed up, but they called him and said, send Marshall again. He said, do you want to do this again? I said, I'm making $15,000 a year. You're paying me $1,000 a day. Yes, sir, I will do this again. And you have to realize 42 years ago, that was a whole lot of money. I said, yes, sir. Well, he called me into the office about two or three years later. And he said, you know, Marshall, you're making too much money. You're making too much money. You're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. You're making too much money. You're running around selling days, and you will never be the person you could become. You're not writing. You're not thinking. You're not building up your career. You're just running around like a chicken with your head cut off selling days. You're doing a good job. You're making good money. Your clients are happy. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing. In essence, what he's saying is you're sacrificing your career for your job. Again, I didn't quite get this. If I had to live my life over, that's the best advice I did not listen to for 10 years. My friend Rick Culley at the New York Stock Exchange, I did a program for the New York Stock Exchange, got rated 4.8 out of 5. I talked to my friend Rick who worked for the Stock Exchange and said, Rick, how can we do better? You know what he said? You're asking the wrong question. You're already doing 4.8 out of 5. This is really great. You're probably not going to get much better. He said, you ought to be asking, how can, how, how can I be better? How can I write more? How can I think more? How can I be more? 
not how can I change this program from a 4.8 to a 4.9. You're fixing the wrong problem here. Well, many women, much more than men, tend to really focus on how can I do a perfect job? How can I make it better and better and better? And sometimes at the expense of our own careers. Because we can get so fixated on doing this perfect job, we, we don't ask ourselves, is it worth it? Peter Drucker said, do not sacrifice tomorrow on the altar of today. Do not sacrifice tomorrow on the altar of today. And if you're not careful, you can get so wrapped up trying to do a great job today that you're sacrificing tomorrow. Now, let's stop. How many of you have ever thought this to yourselves? If I do a great job, I should get ahead. Yeah, many of you have had these thoughts. If I do a great job, I should get ahead. Why? If you do a great job at this level, what does that show? You do a great job at this level. That doesn't even mean you're the most qualified person to go to the next level. You really need to think beyond this level and say, what, if, if you do want to get ahead, what does it take to get ahead? Let me give you another problem women have much more than, than men. Women tend to fall in love with their work teams. Women tend to fall in love with their work teams much more than men. So let us imagine that we're all on the same team, okay? I love my team. Somebody calls up and says, we've got another job offer for you, another company, 10% more. Oh, I can't lead my team. They need me now. Women is much more like, oh, I can't leave. They need me. What's a man say one day? I love you, the best team I've ever worked with. 10% more. Bye-bye. <laughs> gone, gone, gone. I love you. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Well, what happens is you might say in a way that's positive. You think it sort of sounds good. So love the team so much, help the team so much. Doing my best for the team sounds good. In the stream of your life, you may have made a bad decision. Because you could have even more influence here and here and here and here. And you may not get that influence you could have way up here. Why? You're maximizing value right here. Does this make sense to everybody? OK, you're going to talk to your partner 20 seconds to answer this question. What's one thing I've mentioned so far that you can already relate to your own life? Go! Talk to your partner. Talk, talk, talk. And I need a handheld mic. <laughs> this is a fun topic. What's one thing you've learned you can relate to your career, sir, your life? Team. The what? Team. Team. Okay, let's stop, let's stop, let's stop. You're first. Shh, shh, shh. Now, when I call on you, please stand up. Please stand up, because you remember, you're not just talking to me, you're talking to the whole room. Okay, what's one thing you've learned so far? thing that I learned uh, right now was that about the team. Being a woman, I think uh, myself, I'm very passionate with my team. And uh, I exact words that uh, Marshall said, you know, I've got high offers, high incentives, but I always prefer to be, I, I felt I was letting my team down. Mm. I'm very close to my team. That's it. Now, again, I'm not saying you shouldn't be close to your team. It's OK. You can't have it both ways. You can't sit there and say, gee, it's not fair. I'm not getting promoted, yet personally choose not to get promoted. You can't have it both ways. And you need to make a choice. My suggestion to you is strongly consider what you're giving up for the team. And what you may be giving up may be a chance to make not a smaller difference. What you may be giving up is a chance to make a much bigger difference down the road. And you could get so wrapped up trying to do a good thing today, you may be sacrificing tomorrow, a bigger tomorrow. Does this make sense? Let's hear it for her. Very good. Yay! Now, putting your job before career. Why don't people become the people we want to become? I'm going to make a prediction. 
I am the only teacher you have ever met in your life who's collected input from tens of thousands of people that have been to my courses, and I measure, do they do what I teach, and do they get better? I have some good news. The people that do this stuff get better. I have even better news. The people that do nothing don't get worse. It's all good. <laughs> now, why don't people do what I teach? Years ago, my biggest client was a company called Johnson & Johnson. Do all of you know this company, Johnson & Johnson? Yeah, you work there. Who, who works there? You do? Used to. And you know the standards of leadership? I wrote the standards of leadership many years ago for Johnson & Johnson, a wonderful company. In Johnson & Johnson, I had the privilege of working with their top 2,000 leaders, all the way from Ralph Larson, who was the CEO at the time, down to number 2,000. At the end of my class, uh, they were asked a question. I asked them, they all got feedback, pick something to improve, talk to people, follow up, and try to get better. At the end of my class, I asked a question, are you going to do... Are you going to do what Marshall just taught you? They were asked this question. 98% of the leaders said, yes, I'm going to do these things. A year later, 70% did something, 30% zero, not even one minute. Now, I'm not ashamed of these numbers. I'm very proud of these numbers. 70% of 2,000 people is 1,400 people getting evaluated by 10 coworkers each. 14,000 people have a little better life. I'm certainly not ashamed of that. I got to talk to people who did nothing and ask them, why did you do nothing? Their answer had nothing to do with ethics, values, or integrity. They won an award that year, most ethical company in the world. They are good people. I'm sure you're good people. Had, answer had nothing to do with intelligence. You work for Johnson Johnson, top 2,000 leaders, smart. They're smart people. I'm sure you're smart people. The reason people did nothing had to do with a dream. And women have this dream even more than men. This is a dream I've had for years. As I look into your eyes, I think many of you have had this dream. Many of you have had the same dream. Many of you have had the same stupid dream on a recurring basis for years. Some of you are skeptical. You know what you're thinking? He doesn't know my dreams. Don't bet against me on the dream. Are we ready? What does a dream sound like? Everyone look up here, smile, take a deep breath, and go, hand. Ah, hand, hand, hand. Ah, ah. Now, what does that dream sound like? You know... I'm incredibly busy right now, incredibly busy, given pressures of work and home and new technology that follows me everywhere and emails and voicemails and competition, I feel about as busy as I ever have. Sometimes I feel overcommitted. I do not tell others this, but every now and again, my life feels just a little bit out of control. Yet, you know, I'm working on some very unique and special challenges right now. And I think the worst of this is going to be over in about four or five months. And after that, I'm going to take two or three weeks and get organized. And I'm going to begin my new healthy life program. And after that, everything is going to be different. And it will not be crazy anymore. Has anyone in the room ever had a dream that vaguely resembles that dream? And how many years have we been having this same dumb dream? There's not going to be any two or three weeks. Sanity's not going to be prevailing. There's an outside chance tomorrow's going to get even crazier than today. If you want to start working on tomorrow, when do you need to start working on it? Now. Don't wait for next week and don't wait for next month. Don't wait for next year. That's probably not going to happen. Now. The myth, if I do a great job, I'll get ahead, and life is fair and logical. <coughs> How about it's not fair? Ah, it's not fair. Everybody raise your right hand. Everybody raise your right hand. I want you all to repeat after me. Hand, hand, raise your right hand. I want everybody to repeat after me. It's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah, it's not fair. Ah, <laughs> life has never been fair. Now, 